Yeah, it's just called B-roll. You just take B-roll and you chop it up to music and call it a day. So in addition to being a diplomatic mission to Alderaan, it's also a mission for a haircut. Something that's been like a year coming now. So, ah, oh, much better. George Harrison once said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. It's actually a summary of a conversation had between Alice and the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. And like life, the internet has many roads, or routes if you will, when considering TCP IP, the underlying plumbing of the internet developed during the Cold War to be fault tolerant. If two packets leave Boston at the same time, heading for San Francisco, one on a 10 gigabit per second backbone through Denver and the other one on a 100 gigabit per second backbone through Chicago, when will the packets be reassembled? Doesn't really matter. It's a best effort protocol. Denver could get nuked off the face of the planet and, you know, eventually, there wouldn't be an acknowledgement of one of the packets and it'd be retransmitted and go through Chicago. It's just how it is. For TCP anyway. I mean, I, I'd tell you a joke about UDP, but I'm gonna digress right here. Like a letter in the mail, every packet on the internet has an envelope, if you will, a, a header. And that metadata is publicly visible. So while well, what's inside the envelope may be encrypted, where it's coming from and where it's going, the sender and receiver is publicly visible data. And it's what routers use to be able to know like, hey, I got this packet here and it's heading to San Francisco and what's the closest you know, neighbor that I know that's going in that direction and forwards it along. And in our case, from Boston to San Francisco, that route may not be to always go west in the same way that right now in the middle of a sugar field in Oahu, on my way to Wyoming, I've come even further west in America. By the way, if you want to see the routes that your packets take to get somewhere, check out the trace route command. This is probably old hat to you, but in any event, it's kind of nice to be able to see all the little hops along the way. But what if the packet gets lost? What if it keeps bouncing around between Wyoming and Hawaii, never making it to San Francisco, if that's where it's trying to get to? Will it just bounce around the internet for forever? No. We don't have ancient ghost packets, if you will. Uh, we, if that were the case, we'd still have packets from the 1960s trying to get to where they're going. Each envelope, in addition to the, you know, where it's coming from and where it's going metadata, has what's called a time to live in the form of IP version 4 or, or a, uh, a hop limit in, the ver in IP version 6 that says, here's how many times I can go through a router. It's an 8-bit value, so it can be as high as 255. And for each layer 3 networking device, a router, that uh, sees this packet and goes to forward it on, it takes that time to live value and reduces it by one. And if it reaches a router and its time to live is only one, it gets reduced to zero, meaning it just drops that packet on the floor. Sad packet. So how long do they live? Well, in North America, average life expectancy is about 80. It's actually 82 in Canada and 78 in the United States. Oh, Canada. Oh, we were talking about packets. Well, it depends on the operating system. You see, the default time to live for a packet coming from a Windows machine is typically 128 hops. For Mac OS, that might be 64. And for Linux distributions, it varies a lot. I've seen as much as 255. But, you know, all of these TTLs, part of the header, part of that metadata, are publicly visible and it kind of allows anyone to kind of fingerprint in a way any of those packets going in between. You can kind of make some educated guesses based on the default time to lives, uh, as well as other stuff like, for instance, if it's an HTTP packet, so it's not SSL encrypted, you can check out you know, the, the user agent data. And, and that's really useful. And I bring that up because someone who is traveling and is using a 5G cell phone with a hotspot or an LTE modem as their primary forms of internet connection, those, you know, user agent data from, uh, from HTTP, but moreover, 
the time to live values are very important. We've talked about this briefly in another video with Glitch uh, about hacking a modem to change the time to live, but here's why that matters. You see, I mentioned that the default time to live values on a Windows box or a you know, Mac or a Linux box are gonna vary. And the same thing holds true for iOS and Android. So for the cell phone carriers, they are expecting the devices connected to their network to be most likely an Android or an iOS device. And so for a carrier that has an unlimited data plan, they're expecting all of the packets of that unlimited data plan to be with a time to live of that value. So what happens when you throw up a hotspot on your phone? Well, it creates Wi-Fi network and acts as a router. Your laptop then connects to that Wi-Fi hotspot with its own time to live. So if you're on a Windows box, it might start with you know 128 uh, or a Mac might start with 64. And then when it gets to your phone acting as a router, acting as a layer three network device, it sees that time to live on the envelope and it reduces it by one. And then it goes out you know, the WAN connection, the LTE or 5G or whatever have you of the cell phone network. And that's where they see it and realize, hey, it is indeed not originating from the cell phone that should be the one with the, you know, LTE plan. I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to be on this road. So this is why by modifying the modem to spoof the time to live of every packet going through it to make it seem as if it's originating from the phone itself to have the value of the Android or iOS device rather than the laptop that's hopped through it decrementing by one is a pretty good solution in convincing a cellular carrier that the traffic originated from the device and therefore doesn't get throttled in many cases depending on their data plans. And it's also something you can do to obfuscate your traffic. You know, not only would a VPN be useful in this instance because then the carrier wouldn't be able to see what's inside the envelopes and find out it's HTTP traffic with a user agent of like Mozilla or some other, you know, browser that's not expected to be on a phone. And similar to how that obfuscates your traffic, changing your time to live value could very much confuse anybody that's using that passive way of fingerprinting your online traffic. And while Glitch and I may have gone as far as to hack our LTE modems to mangle the TTL of the packets using IP tables, you can just throw up a regular hotspot on your phone and as long as the device that's connected to it, be it your laptop, Windows, Mac, Linux, has a TTL of whatever your phone is plus one, then when it gets to your phone and decrements by one, it's gonna look like traffic from your phone. So as I meander through a sugarcane field in the middle of Hawaii, I offer that to you as my bit of techno lust this week. And Hack Across America continues, most likely eastbound next as we also meander many roads. Trust your techno lust. Somebody lost a flip. Or is that a flop? It might have been a flop. If you're wondering when it's the time to live for you or I, not our computers, the answer is right now. Oop, oh, that road is no longer a road. Doing that thing, the thing you're supposed to do when you find the place. I uh, found it. Thanks for supporting Hack 5. Find all our shows, community, and pen test products at hack5.org.